All righty. So let's get started. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on three brachot. So we're going to focus on the final bracha of the middle section, right? The middle section is 13 brachot, ending with Shema Koleinu. So we're going to focus on Shema Koleinu. And then the final section of the Amidah has three more brachot. We're going to focus on two out of three of them, which essentially means next week we have the final bracha, um, which really includes Birkas Kohanim and Sim Shalom. And then we'll also add the uh, Elokai Mitzor at the, at the end as well. Okay, I'm going to share my, uh, my source sheet in the chat in case you don't already have it. And then we'll get on the road. All right, so it's in the chat now. Okay, so before we look at the text of, of Shema Koleinu, um, I want to just introduce the, the brach of Shema Koleinu with, uh, by means of having two different interpretations that we're going to be seeing throughout Shema Koleinu. One of them is to say that the bracha of Shema Koleinu is an independent bracha, meaning just as we learned all the brachos so far, each bracha stands alone, meaning it's about Yerushalayim, it's about Rafua, it's about Parnasa, it's about Tshuva. And so Shema Koleinu is about something, Tfila. it's about something independent. And that's really the question. Is it something independent? Or is Shema Koleinu truly just a catch-all or forgive me, a Hail Mary, right? It's just like whatever didn't work, let me throw it in into one final bracha. So that's kind of the the, the strain between some of the mafarshim and some of the interpretations that we'll see this evening as to what is the nature of this, um, essentially this 13th bracha of the middle section or uh, 16th bracha in the, in the Shemona Esrei itself. So that's what we're gonna be thinking about um, writ large. But within that framework, remember we've also been describing how there's a, a, a redemptive narrative in the Shemona Esrei. Right, so especially the last few bracha, we had, you know, Kibbutz Galio, we have Tzemach David, we have Yerushalayim, and after Ubunay Yerushalayim, we turn to Shema Koleinu. So is Shema Koleinu building up on that redemptive narrative? Is Shema Koleinu like the pinnacle of redemption? If that's the, if that's the case, so like, what is it? Meaning, I get building up Jerusalem or getting the temple, but, but what is... Shema Koleinu all about? Is it something specific in the, in the arc of Jewish history towards redemption? Or again, is it just a catch-all, right? If nothing else worked, let me just ask Hashem to answer all of my questions. Steve, just click, the, you have to click on mute once I... Oh. Well, we could just say like, we've had all these bakashos, you know, like, like the middle 13 are, are bakashos, right? So we could say the the last one of, of this section is, is that ask, asking Hashem to, you know, to listen to all our bakashos. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's related and it makes sense that it's last, you know, because if you, you know, it's like saying, okay, I've asked for all these things, you know, please um, listen and, and, and react back. So, so great. So Steve is saying it's the catch all essentially, right? It's, it, perhaps building up on everything, but it's not so independent, right? It, it, it's building up on what we've said previously, but it's not like Shema Koleinu has an independent character to it. And I think that might be part of that discussion that we'll have to kind of tease out in the next few minutes. Okay. So I'm going to uh, oh, one other interesting comment um, is that Shema Koleinu um, I just see in the, in the chat, someone messaged me, it is part of the weekday Amidah, right? We don't have Shema Koleinu on Shabbos um, or Yom Tov, right? It's not part of it because again, similar to what Steve said, it's the, it's the final bracha of the bakashos of the requests. Um, but we do say Shema Koleinu um, in a few other um, areas, right? We say, for example, Shema Koleinu, um, in the uh, in uh, Avinu Malkenu, essentially Avinu Malkenu has 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 two lines that are essentially this tefila on Yamim No Rayim, we do put it in there. So Shema Koleinu does have a unique character, perhaps outside of the Bakashos as well. It comes up in a few different areas um, as well. Okay, 
So let me pull up the uh, Shmakalinu text. And as we always do, we'll just look at a couple of interesting kind of themes and, and words that appear to kind of get to the, the bottom of the bracha itself. So the Torah, the, excuse me, the Amidah says, Shema Koleinu Hashem Elokeinu. Listen, Hashem, to our voices. So again, collectively, it sounds like listen to perhaps what we've already said. Shema, right? Chus V'rachem. Chus V'rachem are synonyms, have compassion um, on us. Chus V'rachem Aleinu, on us again. V'kabel B'rachamim, and receive in compassion, uveratzon et tfilatinu, and Hashem, please willfully accept our prayers. Kikel shomea tfilot, because you are a God who listens to prayers, right? You're not just a God out there. You didn't just create the world and leave it. V'tachanunim ata, you are a God who listens to our tachanun, like supplications, like tachanun that we say after the Shemona Esrei. Ata umil fanecha malkeinu rekam al teshivenu. And this is kind of an interesting line here. It's translated as, and do not turn us away empty-handed from your presence. From your presence, our king, do not turn us away empty-handed. Right? We're coming to you. We're asking you for X, Y, and Z. Give it to us. Don't let us walk home without it. And again, we repeat essentially, because you are the God who listens. You'll notice how we have this in a couple other brachot where we open by requesting God to do something, shma, to command, listen. And we end by recognizing that God is a God who listens. And obviously thinking about the notion that shma Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, and here we're also using the notion of shma. Baruch Atah Hashem Shomea Tfilah. We end with, uh, you know, blessing God who listens to Tfilah. Tefillah is the word for the Amidah, right? We call it the Amidah because we stand, but when you ever see the, whenever you see the word Tefillah in Chazal, it's a code word for the Amidah. So God listens to our Tefillah, our Amidah, our requests in the Shemona Esrei. You'll notice off the bat, I highlighted for you the most prominent word, Shema, listening, appears four times. Rachamim appears three times, and Tefillah also appears four times, which is why the bracha ends, Shomei Atfila, the most prominent words, essentially become the chatima, become the conclusion of the bracha. And rachamim is also very important. Um, you know, this isn't the first time we've seen rachamim come up um, in the Shemona Esrei, but it's, uh, it's an emphasis that we give um, when asking God to do something for us, uh, that we ask him to do it rachamim, right? God can give us something without rachamim, but we want it to come to us in, in rachamim. Does anybody have so far looking at this text and perhaps some of the, 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 the patterns I've mentioned, does anybody have any questions or thoughts so far? Again, remember, uh, raise the hands, I raise the chat, you know, use the chat. Okay. So I wanna, I wanna look for a moment at why Shomei Atfila appears uh, specifically here. Right, so the next source I have for you is a source that we're all familiar with because we've now gone through much of it, uh, the, the famous Gemara and Megillah. So the cave on Shabbat David, right? David has come, meaning Yerushalayim is, is been built, Samach David. Again, you notice, remember how I mentioned that the, the Amida, the bracha of Samach David and Yerushalayim may have originally been one. There might be a hint to that in the Gemara itself because previously the Gemara said we have the bracha of David, then we have the bracha of Yerushalayim. But then it says, and then David came. So you can see how the, the, the Gemara somewhat conflates it as well. So bata tfila, tfila comes. Shne emar, as the Pasuk says, v'haviyoti melhar koshi v'simachtim b'veit tfilati. And notice, for those of you who recognize this from uh, when we say it in the liturgy, during Slichos, we recite this Pasuk, v'haviyoti melhar koshi v'simachtim b'veit tfilati. And then we open the Aron Kodesh and say, shema koleinu. Right, so there's a connection here and there. So tefillah comes, because why? We're brought to the temple, to Yerushalayim, that Jerusalem's been built. That was last bracha, and now it's time for tefillah. You may have thought that once the temple's built, it's time for korbanos. Not so fast. It sounds like the, the next stage in the redemption of the Jewish people is actually tefillah in the temple before we get to the notion of korbanos. Um, which is also kind of uh, uh, interesting to note, the Maharsha 
um, uh, kind of adds here that it's actually not as unique as you may think, because if you recall, when Shlomo HaMelech built the first temple, what did he do before he offered the, you know, the numerous number of sacrifices? He davens, right? He famously has, a, has like a, an entire parak of this most beautiful prayer that he offers. So the temple is built. Before we get to Korbano, we do tefillah. And if we think about this in the, the national redemptive process, tefillah might come before Kurbanos return to the temple. So that's an interesting um, thing to think about. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have the temple today, but you, you, you could say, well, people do sometimes go up to Harabide and they, 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 are not, they are not offering Kurbanos, but they are offering tefillah. So we have another step in the redemption of the Jewish people comes with tefillah in the Makom HaMikdash. So again, when we think about Shomei Tfila as both an independent or a catch-all uh, Tfila, there's another layer, which is that it might also be part of this national redemption. And if it's part of the national redemption as a new step, then it sounds different than like a catch-all bracha, right? It's not just saying, listen to everything so far. It's actually adding sub, you know, substance to the previous bracha. So that's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, piece that I wanted to share. I went back to the uh, the bracha itself. Excuse me, the Gemara Megillah. After you now have tefillah, what comes next? And these two are the next, essentially, bracha that we'll be talking about later this evening. The kevan shebata tefillah bata avoda. Now that you have tefillah in the makom mikdash, now we get to have avoda, worship. Avoda obviously uh, is the code word for temple worship, korbanos. And that's the subsequent part of the Pasuk, right? The whole Pasuk, you, most of you probably know it, or you may know the songs. It ends with bringing Korbanot to the temple in Yerushalayim. Once you have brought Avoda, meaning you've done Korbanos, you worship properly in the temple, now comes Toda, quoting a Pasuk in Tehillim. Zoveyach Toda, those who offer um, uh, the Toda offering, right? One of the korbanot that the Beit Hamikdash was known as the Toda offering. It's uh, it encompasses, it has uh, forty loaves, um, and it's very large. So you have to bring people with you to consume it. I um, mean, you have uh, two days to eat it, and it's a big, it's a big um, korban that you bring. And that's when we say mizmor la Toda in the morning. That's that's one of the reasons we say it. It's about bringing thanks. It's a korban of thanks to Hashem. We thank Hashem for um, for 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 allowing us to be there. Meaning now that we have a temple, now that we have Yerushalayim, now that we have Malchus David, now that we have Rafu, and now that we have Tshuva, we get to thank God for all of that which he has given us. So it concludes with Toda, which becomes the Modim Bracha. Avoda becomes the Ritze Bracha, right? Ritze ends with Hamachazir Shechinato Letzion, and Toda off ends with Hatov Shimcha Ulechana Elohodot. Toda. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about these two um, in a few minutes. Okay. A few other pieces um, about uh, Shema Kolenu that I wanted to, to kind of uh, uh, add to the meaning of Shema Kolenu is that you may be familiar that in many Sidurim, Art Scroll included, I, I think Koran does it as well, but I know certainly Art Scroll does. At the bottom, there are these like passages that one may add you know what I'm talking about, right? If you look at the bottom of the Siddur, it says, you know, uh, if you want to add this for this particular sin or this particular, um, you know, request that you have, this is a good time to add it, right? And this is based upon the Gemara. The Gemara teaches us, and we learned this when we talked about Parnasa. You want Parnasa? Talk about it in the bracha of Bari Chalenu. You want Rafua? Do it in Rafua Shlema. If you want anything else, kind of going back to the perhaps catchphrase all, um, type of bracha, so add it here. Or anything that didn't fit so neatly into the prior uh, 12 bracha. So, so you wanted to daven for something that couldn't fit in, so now is the time to do so. There's an interesting controversy um, that, em that emerged with the, the publication of Sidurim like Art Scroll and others because they inserted at the bottom of Shema Kolenu the text of these bracha, the text of these tefillah, right? It says, add here, Yihiratzon, et cetera, you know, add the following uh, tefillah. So wh what's it doing there? 
Meaning, yes, the Gemara permits you to add your own tefillot. However, many um, achronim, including Rav Yaakov Emden, were um, livid by the, by the uh, composition of tefillot to be inserted here. They understood this part of davening to be the, per- the place where you get to add your own personalized tefillot. But if you compose a tefillah to be written and used for this particular bracha, what are you doing? You're essentially adding a new section to the Shemona Esrei. So if you look at the bottom of, of Archbow, for example, and I see a Brandon wrote that apparently in the Quran they only have a special edition for fast, uh, for, um, for droughts, which is in the Gemara and Tanis. So essentially, um, uh, Rav Yaakov Emden and others were opposed to adding these, these pieces that were written. Um, and the one that you see in your art scroll today um, was originally written in Yiddish and it was translated either specifically for the art scroll or perhaps a little bit earlier into Hebrew to be recited and printed in many Sidurim. So that's just an interesting uh, little piece of history about the, the, the printing of the, of the Siddur. But there are many who are opposed to the actual uh, insertion of something specially, especially composed because you're adding to the tefillah um, and it shouldn't necessarily be there. Um, one thing we do add though is, is in uh, Mincha on a fast day. So the individual adds Anenu. So that, that, that has a history to it. Um, but, but otherwise uh, the others are somewhat um, uh, frowned upon by many, by many Achronim. Okay. So now that we have a temple, it's time to go and do tefillah. And that's essentially what Shomea tefillah is about. Yes, uh, uh, Steve. Just click, you gotta click on mute. Yeah. I'm looking at the art scroll and it has, it has two texts. One for forgiveness, one's, one for livelihood. Um, yes. And then also, and also in, um, and in Rufa'enu, it also has um, an insert. It also has an insert. You know, so where you can list individual people's names as an insert. But what's what's um so, but what's so um what's such the opposition to it? Like, if you have just these things, like they're giving you a text to say, you know, an organized text to say, you don't have to say it. So I'm, I'm just surprised that some people were so lividly against providing, you know, this yeah. formulated text. Yeah, the one that I, I saw um, most uh, opposed was Rav Yaakov Emden. Uh, he is well known for his opposition to many things, um, uh, Sabbatinism being one of them, uh, for good reason. But um, so uh, they were opposed to the insertion of what were known as trinos, um, into the into the text of the sitter. They weren't opposed to the rec- recitation of a personalized prayer, but it was supposed to be personalized. Um, and so the purpose of adding your own tefillah was that when I need to, I get to add it. So maybe he would be less opposed if he added it once a week or once a month. But what he was reflecting upon was that it became the norm, that you always added a particular text. And I imagine there were many of these texts going around, or we may have only seen one or two of them that ended up in our sitter, but many of them I assume were going around. And it, it was kind of an, an offense perhaps to the text, meaning the Chazal wrote a text, say the text, you wanna add something else, great. But to then add to it and say like, you know, this piece of paper, put it in your sitter and say it as well, kind of on a communal level was something that he was opposed to, but I definitely understand kind of your, your reaction to, to that. And that's why it is in the sitter, meaning he seemingly lost out that, <laughs> that debate when it came to the article publication, perhaps he won it uh, for Koren. Like, especially the, the Rafaena one. Yeah. I, um, I, I actually say that every day. <laughs> yeah. Um, I insert that every day and, and, and have a short list of names, but yeah, and I think that's the common practice, meaning that has become the common practice, I think. Um, but it wouldn't be wrong, for example, if, if you didn't want to say that text, then you just said, you know, before, then you just added names there. You could say it in English, you could say it in Yiddish, you could say whatever language you want. Um, perhaps Rav Yaakov Emden would say, oh, let's, let's do it, in a, you know, let's not make it uh, obligatory, but, but certainly that, that seems to be the common practice today. 
Any other uh, questions or comment? Yes, uh, Beverly, just click. Um... Yeah, you're good. I'm good. Um, I was going to ask almost the opposite. Why, why would something necessarily be put in? Um, and in my sitter here, which is a little sitter from Yerushalayim, I think, there is two things that you could say. One is about, uh, it's like a vidui, anachatati, aviti, pashati. And the other one is about parnasa. Yes. Those are the two in this sitter. Yes. So different sidurim added um, other pieces. You know, like I said, like if you, if you forgot to say something earlier, you could say it now. Like you could say vidui back by chuva. You could say parnasa back by parnasa. But those are probably the most prominent things on people's minds. Right, think about the, the the couple of things I you could say like what 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 does life boil down to right when it comes to a religious life so, so you want to have chuva and you want to make sure you can support yourself right so the, and you have good health so like those are what end up in the shema kolani right nobody's like adding specific things about like getting a better like you know iPod or something it's specific things that are really important for our lives so that's why they were added and I guess your your first part was why not add it like what's wrong with it. No, what's right with it in a oh, way? Oh, right with it. What's like, right? Aren't these brachot as we say them enough? Not that I'm against it. I'm just, I'm yeah, just yeah. wondering. So I think it was people like specificity, meaning when you compose a tefillah, meaning the Shemona Esrei, you miss out on the individual requests. Right. So, you know, if you have a whole community that wants more parnasa, right? So, so, so you add an extra, an extra part into the bracha of shma, shma And so that's what developed over time. And I think it's part of the human need to essentially want to come close to God and want to ask God in a more personalized um, tone. In a, and again, you don't have to use those texts. You can say whatever you want from your heart. Um, it's tefillah shabalev. But I think that's, that's what's going on here. Okay, any other uh, questions or comments? I actually want to pick up on something that Beverly uh, just said, which uh, she mentioned how one of the texts that says like aviti pashati chata. One of the texts that appears there is kind of like a small vidui um, for sins. It used to be in parts of Ashkenaz that on days that they would recite vidui, meaning uh, you know in Ashkenaz that would be, for example, aserse mechuva in Sfarad. Um, they do that every day. You have tachnun, right? They they say asham lebaganu is etc. Um, every day. Um, but what they would do during Shema Koleinu, especially during the Chazar Hashats, is they would add um, essentially the, um, the Yud Gimel Midos, right? Because we're at Shema Koleinu and we're asking God to listen to our prayers. So what's the best way to do it? And notice how Racham appears so many times. Listen to our prayers. So we would recite Yud Gimel Midos. That also ties very nicely into the notion when we do slichos, we say shema koleinu, we say the yud gimel midos, we say v'ahav yosi mahar kochi, right? These are all part of it. So shema koleinu um, was a place where they would add the yud gimel midos. We don't really do that uh, today. Um, however, it's interesting to note that it's also the 13th bracha of the bakashos, right? So the yud gimel midos, so you have this notion of like 13 um, even though we don't say the Yudgimomidos anymore in, in the Shema Koleinu in itself, um, it ends up being the 13th bracha. So perhaps if this was a course on the, on the sitter through uh, purely Kabbalistic or Hasidic, or Hasidic uh, eyes, we might focus a little bit more um, on, the, on the kind of the deeper meaning behind the Yudgimomidos um, and, and how that aligns with the 13 bakashos in the Shemona Esri. But there, there's another allusion to that as well. Okay. Any other any other questions or thoughts on the Shema Koleinu before we kind of make our way into the Ritzay paragraph? Feel free to raise your hands if you have any questions. Yes, uh, Jonathan, you're unmuted. Um, I, I was just, it, it seems to me that sort of the Bakashas are, are more or less personal and more or less in the singular, but Shema Koleinu is very much like you're just asking to for Israel, for, you know, hear the prayers of Israel more than my own particular prayers. It just seemed very plural. Yeah. So while many of the prayers happen to be written in the plural, you're right to notice that it talks very specifically about the tefillahs of Amcha Yisrael, right? To hear like Koleinu, um, Aleinu, it's very focused on our collective prayers. And I think that also ties very nicely into the practice of adding Yimomidos, right? 
we as a nation, we as a community come before God and say, hear us, listen to us. Um, it doesn't matter what we're asking for, give it to us. And um, that's kind of the, the ultimate way in which we conclude our, our akashas. So when thinking about it as, is it independent or is it kind of that Hail Mary? I think it kind of goes both ways, but I don't think it's, uh, it's kind of either, right? You kind of get a little bit of both in here as well. And you have the national redemptive piece as well. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments before we, we shift gears? Alrighty. So let's, uh, let's shift um, to the Ritze prayer. Before I look at the... Um, um, say, for, by the way, there's another uh, uh, source um, in source number two in the, in the source sheet, just noting that um, on the time that the temple was destroyed, Yom Shecharav Beis HaMikdash, the, the gates of prayer were closed. The only gates that remained in the heavens that were open were the gates of tears, right? You cry and God listens to us. It's harder to just speak to God. But notice how this is now after the temple has been rebuilt, Bonei Yerushalayim, and now the Sharei Tefillah have opened up again. So you have this interesting national piece as well. Okay, so now we, we've now finished the Bakashos, so Mazel Tov. We finished the 13th central um, brachot of the Amidah, and we're uh, switching over to the final three brachot. So if you recall, in the very beginning of our, of our series together, we looked at um, the first three brachot, and we saw a couple of uh, sources through Chazal and Gemaras that talked about how you have the first three, which are all about um, praising Hashem, the middle about asking God for, for bakashos, for things that we need. The final three are praise, uh, excuse me, our thankfulness, thanking Hashem, hoda, thanking Hashem for that which we've received or for at least listening to us to an extent, right? So the end of the last of the part of the Amidah is about thanking Hashem um, for everything that he has uh, provided for us. So once we get to the end, we now bow again, right? We've bowed twice in the beginning, right? Baruch and Baruch in the first uh, uh, bracha. And now in the Amidah at the end, we're going to bow at Modim and we're going to bow at Hatov Shimcha Ulechana Elohodor. We don't bow in the middle. And the reason is we bow in the beginning and the end because when you come before a king, you bow and then you ask him for what you leave, you need. And then on your, when you depart, you bow once more as a sign of, of, um, of, of, gra of, of praise, of gratitude. So we kind of do it at, at the beginning and end of the first bracha and at the beginning and the end of essentially the, um, the, the second to last bracha um, in, in the Shemona Esrei. So we're going to see a bunch of similarities between the first three set of brachot and the last three set of brachot. And I'm actually, I'm hoping that the similarities that I point out to you uh, this evening um, will, be, will be new, right? Uh, I think it's, it's so glaring it's so obvious and on the one hand, but also so hidden on the other hand, right? So I'm going to point out a couple of these pieces to you. And then I feel like you're going to notice it and say like, how did I not see it before? So I'm hoping, I'm hoping we have a few of those moments tonight because I think the Amidah has these really interesting parallel structures on each end. Um, and it's sometimes hard to, to see because we say it all the time. So we don't always think about it, um, but it's good to when we have time to kind of take a, take a moment um, to, to think a little bit uh, deeper about the text itself. Okay, so we're going to open with Ritzei, right? That's the first bracha that we're going to look at in the, the last three. Again, we're just going to look at two of the brachot um, and not the third. But before we do so, I just wanted to point out to you a Mishnah in Tamid. Mishnayos Tamid talk about temple worship, essentially. Um, Tamid meaning like the, the Korban Tamid, the daily sacrifices. And the Mishnah says the following, talking about the Kohan and what they would do. So Amar Lahem Hamimune, the priest would say to the other priests in the temple, this is what it looked like in, 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 the, in the Beis HaMikdash. This was the service. It incorporated both tefillah and avoda, both prayer and worship of, of, of Korbanos. So Baruch Hu Bracha Achas, they would say one bracha, Vehein Baruch So it sounds like almost like Baruch right, that we say in Chachris. Kiro Aseris HaDibros, Aseris Etzvarim, they'd say the Ten Commandments, which used to be recited daily. Shma vihaya im shamoa vayomer, they'd say kriyat shma, right? This is shachris. This is like a proto shachris. Berhu es ha'am shlosha brachos, then they would be, have three brachos recited. These are like perhaps the brachos of kriyat shma. They'd say emet viyatsiv, which comes after the shma. Vi'avoda, then they would do the worship. They'd give korbanos, which could then be interpreted for our purposes as either shmona esra, meaning tefillah becomes a 
a plate replacement for avoda, or you could say maybe the avoda here is a, is a, an allusion to what we will then do in our tefillos, which is going to be the bracha of Ritze, and we'll get back to that in a, in a couple minutes. Ubir kas kohanim, right? The kohanim would bless the nation. Um, interesting to note that remember um, when we dochen today, when kohanim dochen, they put their arms out, um, but in the time of the temple, they put their arms straight up to shemaim, straight up to the heavens, right? We we lower our hands as kohanim in the temple in the synagogue today, but it used to be all the way up. Bir kas kohanim and in our Shemona Esrei, we also have Birkas Kohanim, at least in Shacharis. Ubi Shabbos, they would add a few extra brachot. So what I just wanted to point out with this Mishnah is that this Mishnah shows us what they did in the temple, but when Chazal instituted the Shemona Esrei, they were, and Shacharis, they were picking up on these pieces. So we're gonna have the, uh, the Birkas Kohanim, we're gonna have a Voda, which is gonna essentially be the Ritzei bracha that we're gonna look at um, just now, which is gonna be very much focused on the uh, temple worship. Okay, so let's let's pull that up. Okay, um, we're in the beginning of the final three brachot of the Shemona Esrei. Um, yes, uh, Steve. Um, I don't hear you. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of means there was no Shemona Esrei. So it's uh, it's a good question. So that kind of gets back to our opening shear. When was the Shemona Esrei composed? Was it composed? At the beginning of Bayez Cheney or at the end, at the close of Bayez Cheney, even if it was earlier. So when you say avoda, um, it could be incorporated within that, or you could say that the Kohanim didn't dive in the way that we did, right? They had a different job. They were doing the avoda, and we, Yisraelim, were doing something else, right? There's there's precedent for that, right? There were these uh, uh, Kohanim um, would go to the temple and worship, but in every town in Israel, they had these things called ma'amadot where Yisraelim, Levim, and Kohanim who didn't go to the temple would essentially uh, um, uh, kind of devote themselves to tefillah for a set period of time while people from their town were, were, were in the temple. So like Haifa would send people to the Beis HaMikdash, whoever stayed back would spend a week kind of davening. So, so it, it's possible that what you're saying is absolutely correct, but it's also possible that there was some sort of tefillah as well. Okay. So, Ritzei Hashem Elokeinu Be'amchai Yisraelu B'tfilatam. Ritzei, it's like, be pleased, like Ritzon, Ritzui, uh, you know, uh, listen, it's kind of like Shema, listen to us, but it's like, be pleased with us, Hashem. Be'amchai Yisrael, with your nation, Israel, U'bitfilatam, and their prayer. So this is kind of building off of Shema Koleinu, where we ask God to listen to our prayers and our tfilos. V'hashev et ha'avodah, return, it's like tshuva, return, the avoda to the dvir beitacha. Dvir is a synonym for heichal, for the temple. The ishe Yisrael. What's ishe Yisrael? It's the essentially the fire offerings. Ishe, ishe, it's like ish. Ishe Yisrael, the offerings of Israel. So ishe Yisrael is a reference here to the korbanos. Utfilatam, and prayer. Be'ahava, with love. Receive to kabel beratzon, through, again, ratzon, through your will, utihila ratzon, and may it be your will, tamid avodat Yisrael amecha, that essentially constantly, avodat Yisrael amecha, that constantly you will receive the avoda of your people. Notice how there's like the allusion to the word tamid, it means consistency always, but also refers to the korban tamid, right? You have a play on words here. Fatechazena eneinu, and may you always see um, uh, kind of us, right? Uh, that may you always find pleasure with um, our service um, in compassion. Bless are you, Hashem, who returns um, his Shrina to Zion. I just realized, I apologize, I don't think the uh, English of that last line made it, but return your Shrina to Zion. So there's a lot of things going on in this in this particular bracha. There's a lot packed in, it's, it's pretty short, um, and there's a lot going on here. We're picking up on themes of tefillah, but if you look at the highlights here, just to kind of show you, ratzon is very important. And the word ratzon, which means will, or here a reference to kind of divine will, or perhaps like divine grace that God accepts our prayers or our, our kurbanos is very important. Because if you think about the neviim, 
often what Nevi'im uh, uh, kind of rail about is that Jews were offering uh, korbanos um, and God doesn't want them, right? Because if we're sinning and then give a korban, it's meaningless to God. And so God didn't want them. So when God, when we give a korban, if God doesn't want it, if God doesn't yearn for it, if God doesn't have ratzon for it, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. Um, ratzon and ritsui also has halachic uh, um, uh, uh, parameters as well when it comes to giving korbanos, because if something goes wrong, it might not be uh, properly accepted uh, by God. So again, you have this, this very intricate language that's related to temple worship. The word avoda um, and the word uh, betacha, korbanos, very explicit. So if at one point we talked about, um, we talked about um, avoda and we talked about tefillah, so essentially at this point we are getting ready to, um, to move on to the next section to talk about having a temple with, with avoda. Just give me one moment. Okay. One second, sorry. Let me just pull something up on the screen. Sorry about that, just couldn't get the screen. Okay. All right, so when we look at the, the text itself, so we have a, a few other interesting pieces that emerge in the, in the bracha. If you look carefully um, in the tefillah itself, we ask God to return the shechina to tzion. What does that mean? Return the shechina to tzion. Where is the shechina? Not in tzion. Right, right. If you're asking God to return the shechina to Zion, it's not in Zion. And I think many of us are familiar with this notion that when when um, we were exiled, the shechina was exiled with us, with us as well. So essentially, what we're we're saying is that through our exile, the shechina went out with us, right? And the shechina, it might not be um, uh, it's Hashem, but it's kind of the Hashem that's 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 much more present with us. And so when we return to Zion, when our prayers return to Zion, when our karbanos return to Zion, we're asking God's shechina to return. And what's interesting about that notion is perhaps we can give karbanos before the ultimate redemption has, has been brought about because the shechina has not fully returned because right, it hasn't happened yet. We're, we're already bringing korbanos and the concluding part of the bracha is hamachazir shechina tolatzion. God, who is machzir, his shechina to Zion. So you kind of have this interesting, uh, perhaps circular way of thinking about kind of what comes first, right? Do we give the korbanos and, and that brings God's shechina or, or does us coming back to Zion and giving prayers, is that what initiates God's shechina to come back and then we give korbanos? It kind of is playing on this on this um, kind of uh, cycle of what comes first, um, and that's kind of another piece when it comes to the redemption of Israel. Right, eventually God's presence will be felt ever more um, than it is currently, and that's part of the bracha of Hamachazir Shchina Tolatzion. This is the first bracha of the final three. Nothing in here is about thanks. Right? I was always taught the final three brachot are about hoda. We thank Hashem. This particular bracha doesn't seem to have anything to do with thanks. Any thoughts on that? What is going on? Any? So... On the one hand, it's true. It really isn't focused on, on thankfulness. It's really focused more on the actual avoda. But I would suggest that since it's the opening part of the final three brachot, uh, one maybe it means acknowledgement. Avoda is one way to demonstrate thanks. Exactly. I think these are all. I think these are all um, uh, getting getting at what I think is going on here, which is that this is the final three brachot of the Shmona Esrei. We're building up to something important. And what's the ultimate kind of recognition of, of, of that is when we can be in the temple and give korbano. And part of giving korbano is not only giving, let's say, the tamid and not only giving a chatas, 
but actually giving, for example, a toda offering, a thankfulness offering, right? And the next bracha will be modim, which is obviously much more focused on thankfulness. And the word itself, modim, is, means to think. And it also makes reference to what Chazal tell us is that in the end of days, it could be that many of the korban don't fall to the wayside. However, the korban shel tam, uh, shel toda will remain because it's about thanking Hashem. And when you give a korban of toda, you're thanking Hashem. So this bracha might be like the arch between the 13 bracha we just saw and now uh, the concluding section um, of, of thanking Hashem. And also we focus on ratzon, right? And, and asking God to be ratzon, uh, listen to us and to hear our prayers and accept our kurbanos. Um, and if God does that, then that perhaps is the ultimate version of, of his uh, of His toda towards us. There's this kind of this relationship between us and Hashem. We bring kurbanos to God and God by accepting it um, is, 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 is in a sense um, is showing his toda uh, to us in, in, in kind of a, an interesting relationship way. Um, that uh, ratzon is God's acceptance of our, of our worship. Okay, I wanted to show you something um, interesting about this particular um, bracha and what we're about to note, which is it opens with Ritzei, Hashem Elokeinu. Many um, texts do not have the word Ritzei in the beginning, um, right? It says Ritzei Hashem Elokeinu. Many of them drop the word Ritzei and only incorporate the word Ritzei, says source number four, and I'll just show it to you now. When Simsha, when Elokeinu, Velokei Avoteinu, when, uh, when the the bracha of the Kohanim appears, meaning only in Shachras. So if it's not Shachras, we drop the Ritzei. Why? Because true Ritzei, true uh, pleasing uh, uh, pleasing Hashem uh, through our Tfilos and through our Voda happens through the worship of the Kohanim. And if the Kohanim can't bless us, meaning their blessing us is our relationship between God and the Jewish people. So it's not a perfect Ritzei. So many re remove Ritzei during Minchan Marif. Um, which is an interesting uh, piece. The Sefer HaEshkel notes that, that generally the practice is to remove Ritzei. The Shulchan Aruch notes that it was the practice, um, Rav Yosef Karu notes it was the Sardic practice to not say Ritzei. However, eventually they kind of got used to saying it as well. But this notion that thanking Hashem, having a relationship with God is only complete when we have um, people who can, who can initiate for us and who can show God's blessing on us as we throw our praise and blessing on God. So again, I think it highlights this relationship between the Jewish people and Hashem through tefillah and through korbanos and the kohanim end up being this kind of the intermediaries uh, for us as well. And that's obviously what avoda is truly all about because as a Israel, I, I don't actually get to do the avoda. I need a Kohen uh, to do it for me. Okay. There's an interesting interpretation also that v'techazena e'neinu b'shuv chalatzion b'rachamim is a request for God to return chazon. What is chazon? Vision, prophecy, nevua to the land of Israel. V'techazena e'neinu, let our eyes go out and see through prophecy. So perhaps there's also an allusion to a future of prophecy returning, which will happen when God Shechina returns to the land of Israel. But Yehuda Halevi and others in that, in that kind of genre of rabbinic uh, writers um, speak very heavily about the notion of Shechina returning and then Nevu'ah returns. And that really finds itself uh, meeting at the intersection of this particular bracha. So you see that a little bit as well. Um, the Rambam, by the way, has a tshuva that says that it's okay if you add the words reyach nichoach in this particular text. What's reyach nichoach? The incense that was offered in the court in the Beit HaMikdash. So there were texts of the Amidah that went around during his time period where they would even add that, which is to say it's the, it's, it's the meat, it's the korban, it's the, it's the, and it's also about the smells from the ketoret, etc. So you really have um, a very explicit nature of korbanos in this particular bracha. But this particular bracha leads itself very um, seamlessly into the next one, which is modim. Um, and that's what we'll turn to in just a moment. But before that, just want to show you one last piece, which you may be familiar with from Yom Tif. How do we end this bracha on Yom Tif? We change the text a little bit. We say, v'te'arev, there's a nice tune. But we end, baruch ata Hashem she'otcha na'avod. 
right, that in, in, in fear we shall worship you. This conclusion of the bracha was the way that people in the land of Israel 1,500 years ago ended their bracha. They did not say, they said, not sure why, maybe because they already lived in the land of Israel, so they were they were kind of already closer to Hashem and the Shekhinah, maybe, so now they're only asking for the Avodah, we're, we're a little bit step behind, so we're asking for the return of Shekhinah to Zion as well, um, but we pick up on this text and use it um, during during the um, during Yantif, when we when we dochen. Again, Avodah, dochen, Kohanim, so we'd say, it's kind of all building up to Avoda and Birkas Kohanim is actually really important for the last part of this, of this part of the Shemona Esther, the last three brachos. And that becomes clear through the Mishnah and Tamid where Birkas Kohanim is very important as well. I think as, as Ashkenazim who live in Chutz Aretz, we very much downplay, um, at least during the year, the Birkas Kohanim, we don't think about it very often. We don't even say, okay, we just recite it. We don't do it. Um, but if you're Sephardi or you live in the land of Israel, right, Birkas Kohanim happens every single day. Um, and it's much more integral to the davening experience. And through the Mishnah and Tamid, and I think through some of these texts, you can see it really is important. It fell out of use in Ashkenaz in some places a thousand years ago, 800 years ago for Tuma reasons and, and, and other reasons that we can get into another time, but it was very important um, in other communities for centuries. Okay, and with that, I want to turn to Toda for the last uh, last couple of minutes that we have together. Yes, Beverly, just click the. Just a quick question. I'm a little confused about what you were saying about the Kohanim bringing the Karbanot for Toda. So oh. the the Kohanim are the ones who, in in essence, do the thanking. So the Kohanim in the Beit Hamikdash are the ones that. Uh, uh, kind of work in the temple. Meaning if I want to bring a toda, I can bring a toda as a non Kohen. I want to thank God. So I bring my korban to the temple. I can do part of it kind of leading up to the actual uh, slaughtering essentially, but the offering and everything else happens only in the temple itself um, by the Kohanim, not by me. I, I get stopped at the door, right? There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a door where I cannot pass. Mm -hmm. So the Kohens essentially become the people who work in the temple. They're the ones who bring the tamid and the daily offerings, and they're the ones who bless us every single day. Um, so they essentially do things on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So in, in this tefillah in Shemona Esrei, the hoda'ah is assumed to be a karban. So it seems that the ultimate way to do hoda'ah, to thank Hashem, is through korbanot. We can't right now, so we, we verbalize it. But what I'm suggesting is that the illusion in the text, and perhaps even explicitly in the text, is that we're thanking Hashem. And the ultimate goal is that this thankfulness translates into a korban of I see. Yeah. Good question. OK. So now I want to show you uh, the, last, uh, the, last, uh, the last of the bracha that we'll, we'll look at this evening, which is the modem bracha. Where it opens up, we are thankful to Hashem for everything that you do to us. Forever, you are the rock of our life. You are our protector, our savior. You are forever, Lador in every generation. That's one way to read it. Or we could say, Atahu, that we, Lador Vador, no Delacha, that we in every generation thank you. It's a huge machloket where La Dorva Dor gets placed. Is it on the, is it on Hashem? Is it, or is it on us who La Dorva Dor thank Hashem? Or is it both? We can, uh, it's up for, it's up for a debate. We speak your praise, which is why we incorporate Al Hanisim in this particular bracha when, when it's Purim, Hanukkah. Our lives are tied into your, 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 your decisions, right? We're here one day, we're gone another. It's, that's what it's about. Our neshamos are in your hands. So we're thanking you for our ability to live. Again, this is, this is quintessential thankfulness. And the miracles you do for us every single day. And then the float, Rabbi a Monk and others say that maybe a nais um, is considered something that we see and maybe a nifla is something, a miracle we don't even know that's happening all the good that you do for us daily, 
Erev Vavoker Vitzoharayim, evening, morning, afternoon. On the one hand, talking about the different times of the day, but also perhaps a reference to Korbanot. Erev is a reference perhaps to the, the Korbanot that burned overnight, which is like Mariv. Boker is the Korban Shel Tamid in the morning, and then Sarayim is the Korban Shel Ben Harbaim. Hatov Kilo Chalur Chamecha, right? Um, that you have done for us, and you, um, we hope that you don't hold back your Rachamim from us. Kilo Tamu Chazadecha Meolam Kivinulach. Your Chesed is, 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 is forever, is great. And so we're praising you for, for that. The Bracha then concludes, um, and we'll look at this part in, uh, just briefly here. And for everything that you've done for us, we're going to exalt your name, right? Because what it, when we praise Hashem and we thank him for what he's given us, part of that thankfulness is our job on earth is to elevate God's name, right? That's like Yitkadavit Kadash, right? Praising and, and elevating God's name. So Shimcha Malkenu, our king's name forever. Tamid, again, like a reference to the Korban as well. Vikola Chaim Yodu Chasela, all of our lives, we Yodu, we Modim, we praise you. And we praise you, Yahalalu, like Halal. At Shimcha, again, Shimcha, 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 Be'emet, in truth, the God of Yeshua and Ezra of salvation and, 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 and helping us. Selah is kind of like, uh, wow. Baruch at Hashem HaTov Shimcha Ulcha Na'e Lahodo. God who is good and his name is good. And to you, we praise. Lahodo, we praise. The word modim means thankfulness, but it also has another meaning. It can also mean vidui. It can also mean I'm thankful to Hashem. I need mode, I'm hoda'a. But it also is similar to the word of vidui. And this actually comes up with the character of Yehuda. Yehuda is named Yehuda. Leah says, Ode, I praise Hashem. That's when she names him. But Yehuda becomes the ultimate uh, uh, person who does essentially vidui because he says when he when Tamar is going to be burnt to the, on the stake, essentially, he says that she's tzat kamimani, right? He recognizes his failures. So we as the Yehudim, as the Jews, um, we're kind of stuck, uh, right? We, we thank Hashem, but we also, part of that process is also recognizing our failures. And that's what it means to be a person um, and to be a Jew, Yehuda, who comes from Yehuda. So if you read the text, you'll notice that you can read it through the lens of thankfulness, or you can read it through the lens of vidui as well, which ties nicely into the notion that perhaps people said vidui um, at Shema Kolenu. But I wanted to point out to you a couple, a couple interesting parallels between this bracha and the first three brachot. Remember, who are the first three brachot um, about? Remember, we talked about this. There's obviously the text, but there's kind of a meta analysis of the first three brachot that are references perhaps to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the first three brachot. And what we see here is references once more to the first three brachot. I want to show those to you right now. God is Magain Yishenu, Magain Avraham, Matzmiach Yeshua, right? That's, that's the second bracha about Yitzchak. Ledor Vador is the third bracha about Yaakov, which is Kedusha. So in these three words here, we have a reference to the first, second, and third bracha of the Shemona Esrei. So we see how it kind of is picking up on the original themes of the Shemona Esrei and bringing them back to life because this is a close. So when you close a good book, when you close a good story, you reference back in some sort of fashion and an allusion to the original, which also ties into the major machlok about tefillah. Who established the tefillah? Avos, connected avos tiknum or connected korbanos tiknum? That's the major machlok in, in, the, in the Gemara. We discussed this in the very beginning of our, of our course. And this Bracha alludes to both. Obviously, Avram Yitzhak Yaakov in reference to Magen Yishenu um, and Lador Vador. And we also have reference to Erev Avoke Ritzohorayim, right? A reference perhaps to Korbanos, also a reference to Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, right? That they each davened at different times of the day, says essentially the Medrash based upon the Psukim in the Torah. And we talk about obviously Korbanos here, right? Tamid. Um, and other references as well. So I think this final kind of ma massive bracha here, the second to last bracha, Modim, focuses on themes that we mentioned earlier, but also is, uh, is kind of uh, synthesizing the major 
origins of the Shemona Esrei, both Keneged Avos Tiknum and Keneged um, Korbanos uh, Tiknum as well. So I think we see that kind of reemerge here. And by the way, on Rosh, Chod- Rosh-, Rosh Chodesh, Pesach, Sukkot, we add Yalav Yavo um, uh, uh, just before this particular bracha, um, because Yalav Yavo um, is all about um, going back to the temple to do Avoda. Right? So you see how between Ritzay and Modim, we focus heavily on Avoda worship in the temple. And that's why we reference Rosh Chodesh, because we want to be back in the temple to give the proper korbanos um, on, those, on those holidays. So you see how we have a couple of pieces here um, that reference um, other um, earlier, earlier references, earlier, earlier brachos. But there's, there's one last piece. And with this, we'll conclude um, the shear for the evening. And then I'm happy to take additional questions. Um, and by the way, the shimcha, again, it's just because of praise of Hashem is what it means to either praise Hashem, lahodot Hashem, to thank Hashem, um, or to do vidui. Right? To do vidui is to recognize um, that we've sinned, and, and part of that process is, is a return to Hashem. Is something that I'll just mention very briefly in like two or three minutes is the modim de Rabbanan. You might remember that Chazar Hashatz. Um, we haven't done Chazar Hashatz really in, an enti- in, in its entirety at the Jewish Center for a while now um, uh, during a coronavirus. But um, when the Shliach Tzibor does modim, we say a different text. The Gemara, which is the next verse, you can look at it inside, uh, describes that they were different practices. Some said like one line, some said two lines, some said three lines. And essentially what this modim de Rabbanon is, it's called modim de Rabbanon because it's essentially a compilation of different versions of Chachamim put together. It's literally like sewn together. And that's what the Gemara teaches us. It's essentially the same as what we say by ourselves or the Shliach Tzibor with different words. It's essentially what it is, right? It's a little bit more explicit. For example, bring us out of our exile to your temple where we can properly observe the laws. And and we end, Baruch Kel Haudo, thank you, Hashem, blessed Hashem, um, who is the God of things. So essentially the similar bracha, but a little bit um, uh, with a couple of different themes. But what I wanted to, to, to just try to end with here is, is why, do we, why do we have this? Meaning we don't do this for any other bracha in the Shemona Esrei, right? When Shliach Sibor is saying Rafaini, I don't, I don't say a different tefillah. So, so why here? Um, one reason might be because modim, the Mishnah tells us, if you say the word modim, modim twice in a row, um, it's as if you're a kofar. Why? because it's as if you're thinking God A and God B. So perhaps there was this notion that with the Shliach Tzibor saying modim, and we're silent, that we're perhaps uh, not fully recognizing God um, in a proper way, right? It's as if we're, we're saying, right, he's, he's praising Hashem and we're, we're busy doing something else. So one, one, one reason we might add it is based upon that Mishnah, that it's inappropriate when somebody's recognizing Hashem in a very significant way, the brach of modim, that we be silent. So we add our own prayer. Another way, says the Abu Draham, is that modim is like Shema. Shema is about Kabbalat ol malchut shemaim, accepting upon ourselves the yoke of heaven. And so when we say modim, it's like a mini ol uh, Kabbalat ol malchut shemaim. That is to say, at the moment of modim, we recognize um, all that God has given us and we thank him for it, right? And part of accepting the yoke of heaven is, is recognizing where everything comes from. And so uh, one is, uh, the Abu Drahan living in medieval Spain suggests that maybe it's like that, in which case, again, when the shliach tzibor, when the, when, the, when the shul says shma, let's say you're not up to shma, you should stay shma with them, right? Because otherwise you seem to be rejecting the premise of shma or you're rejecting God. So there, is, seem, there does seem to be this, this practice that developed over the last 16, 1700 years to add a special modim at this very point to thank Hashem for choosing us and to allowing us to worship, uh, to worship him solely. So that's the conclusion of the second to last bracha of the Shemona Esrei. Next week, we will pick up with the final bracha with, with Elokeinu, Elokei Avotenu, and Sim Shalom, and Elokei Netzor, and um, we'll kind of wrap up the entirety of the Amid. I'm happy to stick around to answer questions, um, and I'll also allow people to uh, to um, unmute themselves at this at this time.
Have a good night. Night, thank you. Thank you. I was actually gonna ask about um, about Yala Vyavo, which you touched on a little bit at the end, but I guess I could I see how you, you know we're talking about returning to Jerusalem and the holidays and it's kind of implicit the whole theme of Avoda. Uh, but I, it's not really called out at all. Like it talks about, you know, Yerushalayim, it talks about Ben David, like I could have seen it in either of those places and it doesn't really talk at all about, you know, Avoda or, or Hoda or anything like that. Um, so so your question is why do we put it here and not earlier? Yeah, why here not anywhere else? Or if it's going to be here, why not you know tie it more clearly with Avoda somehow? Yeah. So the language of 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 the Yalev Yavo is essentially like bring us higher, bring us closer. Yalev Yavo via Giva your Evi your Like it uses a lot of words that are kind of building upon each other to bring us, elevate us essentially to Jerusalem. Um, and then we say kind of remember us because we want to do what is appropriate for us to do on these holidays. Because if you remember, Rosh Chodesh is the perfect example. There's no other mitzvot associated with Rosh Chodesh. It's essentially just giving the korbanos of Rosh Chodesh. I mean, Sukkot and Pesach, obviously you have other uh, um, uh, mitzvot, but when it comes to tefillah, we tie it into um, the major theme of the Amidah, which on a national level is the resumption of our worship in Yerushalayim. So that also ties in very nicely to the notion of Shalosh Regalim, right? Because we have to get there. So I, I could definitely hear an argument for adding it like in the Bonei Yerushalayim piece, but that might be too soon. Right? Because Bonei Yerushalayim is about just getting to the temple, getting to Jerusalem. Now that we're here, we have to do something. And that's essentially what these brachos are about, the actual avoda. In Bai Cheni, to what extent did we have the Shechina? Great question. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, <laughs> Bai Chini was imperfect. Um, mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there was certainly the Shrina was there, but on a lesser level than it was in Bai Rishon. There were many distinctions. So Bai Rishon, for example, the, the Aish that came down, that went up from the Mizbeach, really came down from the heavens. Mm -hmm. Shrina was not present. We had an Aron Koda, an Aron uh, with the Lufos in them. We don't have that in the second Beit HaMikdash. And also there was a lot of um, uh, improper Kohanim and, and things going on in right. the temple. So the screen was there, but um, much less so. Um, I have a, can you hear me? Yeah. I have a question, but if it takes too long, I'm happy to wait. I don't think I came to the first class or two. So I know that the, the, one of the purposes of tefillah is instead of the karbanot. Yeah. So, so in these, I understand where the, to, the todah, the thanks, goes from, comes and goes from a karban. But what about the bakashot? bakashot? Yeah. So is, was there, okay, so I don't know if I missed it, something. Or we no, no, it's a good question. Um, you didn't miss it. It's, it's that. The bakasho don't really correlate to a particular korban, um, right? They, you have the korban of the tamid, which was the daily offering. It wasn't necessarily associated with a request, um, but that's why the, no -sure, the nature of tefillah is on the one hand a replacement for korbanos, but it's also independent of korbanot. Right? The Torah talks about um, worshiping Hashem, and Hazal interprets some of those pesukim to not references, uh, to not referencing temple worship, but rather prayer. So prayer always existed as an independent function from Korbanot, but once the temple was destroyed, so it took on an extra layer of meaning. It's not only about asking God for refuah, but it's also asking for the resumption of Korbanot. I see, so prayer existed at the same time as Korbanot? Yes, but what that prayer looked like is, is kind of up for debate, right? It, it likely, it may have looked like our Shmona Esrei sometime during Bait Cheney. It may have not. It may have only turned into that toward the end of Bait Cheney. Certainly in Bait Rishon, they did not have the Shmona Esrei. Um, but they had to be loved. Meaning we have in the Tanakh, right? Shlomo HaMelech Davids, right? People right. Davids in Tanakh. Right. Right? Set. Uh -huh. Set, set uh, rules or set uh, prayers. Uh-huh. But do we know if the average person would daven for good crops or for refuah? 
So I imagine the answer is yes, because that's just natural, but there wouldn't have been a, a text Anything for that. formal, right, right. By the Thank way, you. yeah, this is good for next week, but the, I think it's, a, if I'm not mistaken, the oldest Hebrew, the oldest text of the Tanakh that we had, the oldest text of the Bible, Chamish, uh, Chamish Torah that we have today is the Birkat Kohanim. It's written on a, like an, almost like an amulet in the Israel Museum in uh, not, 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 the Hebrew te- uh, versions we have today, but um, in um, like Ashri- uh, the earlier the earlier Hebrew texts, um, and um, that was seen as like a some sort of protection. And so you see how how predominant that was in ancient Israel twenty five hundred years ago, and obviously it's pr- prom- very prominent in the Mishnah and becomes very prominent in our Shmona Esrei. Although perhaps it became a little less prominent um, in the way that we dive in today. But I'm trying to kind of remind us that no, the Avoda reaching the avoda is actually very crucial to our to our tree load. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Have good a good night. Everyone. Good Thank night. you.